In 1902, John Beard, a professor of embryology at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, reported that there were no discernible differences between highly malignant cancer cells and certain pre-embryonic cells that were quite normal in the early stages of pregnancy. In technical terms, these normal cells are called trophoblasts. Extensive research had led Professor Beard to the conclusion that cancer and trophoblast are in fact one and the same. His theory, therefore, is known as the trophoblastic thesis of cancer. The trophoblast in pregnancy indeed does exhibit all the classical characteristics of cancer. It spreads and multiplies rapidly as it eats its way into the uterus wall, preparing a place where the embryo can attach itself for maternal protection and nourishment. The trophoblast is formed as a result of a chain reaction, starting with another cell, identified as the diploid totipotent. For our purposes, let's call this simply the total life cell, because it contains within it all the separate characteristics of the complete organism and has the total capacity to evolve into any organ or tissue, or for that matter, into the complete embryo itself. About 80% of these total life cells are located in the ovaries or testes, where they serve as a genetic reservoir for future offspring. The rest of them are distributed elsewhere in the body, for a purpose not yet fully understood, but which may involve the regenerative or healing process of damaged tissue. The hormone estrogen is well known for its ability to affect changes in living tissue. Although it's generally thought of as a female hormone, it's found in both sexes and performs many vital functions. Wherever the body is damaged, either by physical trauma, chemical action, or illness, estrogen always appears in great quantities, possibly serving as a stimulator or catalyst for body repair. It's now known that the total life cell is triggered into producing trophoblast when it comes into contact with estrogen. When this happens to those total life cells that have evolved from the fertilized egg, the result is a placenta and umbilical cord, a means of nourishing the embryo. But when it occurs non-sexually as part of the general healing process, the result is cancer. It's now known that the total life cell is triggered into producing trophoblast when it comes into contact with estrogen. When this happens to those total life cells that have evolved from the fertilized egg, the result is a placenta and umbilical cord, a means of nourishing the embryo. But when it occurs non-sexually as part of the general healing process, the result is cancer. When cancer begins to form, the body reacts by attempting to seal it off and surrounding it with cells that are similar to those in the location where it occurs. A bump or lump is the usual result. Under microscopic examination, most of these tumors are found to resemble a mixture or hybrid of both trophoblast and surrounding cells, a fact which has led many researchers to the premature conclusion that there are many different types of cancer. But the degree to which various tumors appear to be different is the same degree to which they're benign, which means that it's the degree to which there are non-cancerous cells within it. The greater the malignancy, the more these tumors begin to resemble each other, and the more clearly they begin to take on the classic characteristics of pregnancy trophoblast. And the most malignant of all cancers, the chorionepitheliomas, are almost indistinguishable from trophoblast cells. For as Dr. Beard pointed out over 70 years ago, they're one and the same. Let's turn now to the question of defense mechanisms. Before we can hope to conquer cancer, first we must understand how nature conquers cancer, how nature protects the body and controls the growth of trophoblast cells. All animals contain billions of white blood cells. One of the functions of these cells is to attack and destroy anything that is foreign and harmful to our bodies. For this reason, it would seem logical that they would attack cancer cells also. But since cancer is trophoblast, and since trophoblast is not foreign to the body, but is in fact a vital part of the life cycle, nature has provided it with a very effective means of avoiding the white cells. One of the characteristics of the trophoblast is that it's surrounded by a thin protein coating that carries a negative electrostatic charge. The white cells also have a negative charge, and since similar polarities repel each other, the trophoblast is well protected. Part of the solution to this problem is found in the pancreas, 
which secretes an enzyme called trypsin. When this enzyme reaches the trophoblast in sufficient quantity, it digests the protective protein coat. The cancer then is exposed to the attack of the white cells, and it dies. Applying this to the embryo, we find that the trophoblast cells there continue to grow and spread right up to the eighth week. And then suddenly, with no apparent reason, they stop growing and are destroyed. Recent research has provided the explanation. It's in the eighth week that the baby's pancreas begins to function. Now it's significant that the upper intestines, near the point where the pancreas empties into it, is the one place in the human body where cancer is almost never found. We note also that diabetics, those who suffer from a pancreas malfunction, are three times more likely to contract cancer than non-diabetics. These facts, which have puzzled medical investigators for years, at last can be explained in light of the trophoblastic thesis of cancer.